I bend the knee to all of you guys, by the way. I have no idea how I got here, but I'm very grateful. <laughs> Welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, it's brilliant to have you here. Um, to start, I actually have a question for everyone. So I'm going to ask it and then come to each of you in turn, because it applies to all of you. Each one of your performances is so vivid. You know, when we're watching them, we feel like we end up knowing your characters so well. Uh, and I wondered at what point in the creative process did you come to know and, and understand your character? Does that happen instantly on page one of the script or, or does it happen much later? I mean, does it really only happen actually when, when you're on set? Um, Joanna Scanlon, I'm going to come to you first. Um. <laughs> Me first, please. You're on the spot. <laughs> um, well, actually, I can think of a moment, sort of, which was um, we'd actually just started shooting. We were doing drone shots, and it was early, early doors. Um, and I really couldn't find how to um, play the Namaz prayer because it felt like a, um, it felt like a. A stretch in it like it was hard to, to get in, get on top of the Arabic and so on anyway I asked Talid Aris his mum who was there because he was only 16 at the time and he had a chaperone who in this week was his mum I said could she re record it for me and she just did the namaz prayer on on my phone on my iPhone uh, and we were sitting on the White Cliffs of Dover looking out to Calais and um, she did it so beautifully that it just, I thought, oh, okay, that, that's, that's where I'm headed. So that's, 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 that's the inner person. That's like the core of that person. And if I can reach to that, then I've got an inkling about the character. Fantastic. I mean, there were many other things before that, but that was a big moment. Fantastic. And thank you for going first, Joanna. I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> Lady Gaga, let me bring you in. Um, I mean, in, in your creative process, at what point did Patrizia Gucci kind of, you know, take shape in front of you? At what point did you think, I know this woman? Um, well, first of all, uh, thank you so much for having me today. And I feel really honored to be here with all these incredible women. And uh, I look up to all of you. Uh, so and in terms of your question, actually, I feel like I have sort of multiple answers, which is that, I, at, at some point right before we began filming, I felt that I had done a lot of research on Patricia and uh, really delved into the script. Uh, I, I spent a lot of time studying the script in a very specific way in an effort to understand her as well as understand myself as it relates to her, meaning what about P Patricia was like me and what about Patricia was not like me and how do you fill in those gaps and those holes? So when I got to Italy, once I started to talk to Italian people and uh, really live in Rome uh, as her, th there, was, there was a sense of, um, of becoming that I really experienced. And yet I also feel like the best way for me to truly answer this question is to say that I don't feel like I really knew exactly who she was until I was done filming um, because, you know, you, you think you know a character, or you think you know the person, especially playing somebody real. Um, you think you know absolutely everything about them as much as you can, but I feel like I was a student throughout this entire process. So I wouldn't even wanna really say that I knew her perfectly before we started. I discovered her in every scene. Uh, I discovered her through her relationships with uh, the entire family. Uh, and I also discovered her through how I injected myself into the performance, meaning I've had a complicated relationship with uh, patriarchy and uh, you know women's roles in the world. And in what ways did, did all of that information and that perspective inform this performance? Uh, I think that she, uh, she operated inside of a system that was inherently designed to push her down and uh, it did. And by the end of filming, uh, I felt that I really, really knew her. And in that way, I was also ready to leave her because I, uh, I got so close to it that it, it, it was time for it to be over. Perfect. Renata, let me bring you in. Um, what's your relationship with, with Julie in, in The Worst Person in the World? How, how quickly did you come to know this very complex character? Yeah, it's very complex. It's rarely complex. And I, I'm of the opinion that uh, human beings can't really see themselves what they are truly. 
And uh, for me, I think it was, you know, about like uh, giving it as much nuance and as much complexity as I could and put it all in there for a structure to be free within that structure. But I, it's a, it's a difficult question because I felt that I didn't know who she was when I was filming her. I had a sense of what choices she wanted to make and of course couldn't make, uh, that's her core too. Uh, but it was very, I guess when I met the audience uh, and started talking about Julie and people having a very um, personal, um, emotional uh, uh, connection to Julie and to the film, I felt uh, I knew her in a different way. So it's it's still like on, ongoing uh, conversations about who she is and what she represents. And uh, I am I love that character. So I'm very happy that I like a year after now get to talk to uh, people about her still. Amelia, let me come to you. And that's so fascinating, actually, um, that idea that the character kind of changes in the eyes of other people. So so let me sort of tweak the question for you really, both about when you, you got to know Ruby in CODA, but also whether maybe your relationship with her has changed since the film came out. I really got to know Ruby quite quickly because I was cast on, I think, a Friday. And then on the Monday, I went straight into American Sign Language training. And I had an amazing coach who was deaf. And so I immediately was learning about the culture, about the language. He was telling me stories in ASL and I guess I just learned a lot faster than I thought I would because he was such an amazing teacher and I trained for nine months and so I was learning more and more and more and more and more and then I spoke to a lot of coders also in in my prep time and I think that's when I really started to understand the character and her kind of battles her inner battles and the fact that this character feels like she's part of two worlds, the hearing world and the deaf world, but doesn't really feel like she belongs to either. Um, but I was 17 and Ruby 17. I think that rarely happens. Um, people always you know, tend to cast older and I totally understand. I was always losing out to older girls because they could work a full day on set and I couldn't. Um, but I was glad that Sean, Sean did cast authentically um, because I was kind of at that age where um, I guess I was figuring out who, who I was and um, and then I guess you asked about how things change when the movie's out it hasn't really changed I think because I was so close to Troy Marley and Daniel and I kind of became a coder on the film set because we were filming in this tiny house and we were only allowed I think it was like six or seven crew members in at once and so people couldn't get in interpreters couldn't get in to kind of talk so I ended up interpreting for Marley Troy and Daniel and I kind of became the little coder and then it's been really nice that people after they've seen the movie, coders especially, have come up to me and, and said thank you for kind of representing our community on screen. And so it's been just a wonderful, really, really lovely experience. And I, I loved every second. And Alana, how about you with, with Alana in Licorice Pizza? Um, I mean, she's, a, she's like this box of surprises in the film. But I mean, did you know from your first morning on set exactly who this woman was? Or was that a bit of a kind of surprise for you as you were working through the film? Um, I mean, Alana Kane is a little bit more unhinged than Alana Hyam. Um, <laughs> she, she yells a lot more, especially to her family. Um, but no, I remember the thing that I feared the most is playing this part was that I had to drive this stick shift 70s U-Haul truck. And I didn't think that I was actually going to do it until I was told, no, you are, you are doing this. And there was this one move that I had to do. I had to reverse very quickly and then go forward and then but also say lines. And I'll never forget when I did this like very dangerous move that was so incredibly physical and that I could say lines as I was doing it. I remember I walked out of the truck and everyone was just stunned because I definitely probably almost hit a bunch of parked cars. I knew I was good. No one else did. But I knew that if I could do that, something so physical, because again, I've never done this before. I bend the knee to all of you guys, by the way. I have no idea how I got here, but I'm very grateful. <laughs> um, but I had never done this before. Uh, I'm a musician. And so I doing something so physical and being able to kind of do a million things at once, um, it made me feel so incredibly powerful. And, and it made me really fall in love with Alana Kane. I wish I had more of her confidence in uh in real life but no she's super powerful 
uh, super intense. Again, a little unhinged, but a lot of fun. And, and I, I, I very much loved her. <laughs> It's kind of mind blowing that Licorice Pizza is your, is your first film, but it's also the first film of your co-star Cooper Hoffman. And I wonder, was there a sense on set that both of you were, were kind of finding your way through this thing together a little bit like Alana and Gary are as characters in the film as well? Completely. I mean, um, me and Cooper Hoffman, yeah, had never done this before, which honestly I think worked in our favor because we were both so close in the fact that we both didn't know if we were doing okay. So I could call him every day and be like, I'm sorry, I stepped on your line. He's like, no, 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 it's my fault. It's my fault. I did everything. We, we were both very insecure <laughs> throughout this whole process. Um, but I was so grateful because we had, I think it was super important that me and Cooper became close before we started shooting um, because we had three months um, of just getting to know each other through FaceTime because it was COVID. So we would just talk all the time and had an incredible connection. We let, we grew up, I mean, grew up, he's 10 years younger than me, but we liked the same music. We loved the same things almost instantaneously. And, and it was so great because when we started at day one, um, we started with John Peters, um, Mr. Bradley Cooper, <laughs> uh, who we, that scene, I mean, to jump in to basically almost the end of the movie, um, where we're super close. We have to be incredibly close because it's us against the world. We have this beast that we have to tame and we have to be together in this. It's this obstacle that's so great and, and we can only work through it together. Um, and so showing up on day one and having him basically be my brother at that point, it was like, oh, we got this. It's you and me against the world. And it was so important because it really did feel like we could jump in and and do this together and it's still that way I mean he's still my best friend I think I wouldn't have been able to do this without him you mentioned earlier coming to the film as a musician and I wondered how much making the movie felt connected to that creative life I mean obviously you've worked with Paul Thomas Anderson on a whole bunch of music videos before but but is there a deeper connection going on there as well um I mean I think the thing I mean and we have another amazing, incredible musician in this, in this talk too, which is very comforting. Um, but I think it, it really goes back to being able, when you step on stage, it's so, you know, so many things can happen at an instant. I mean, there, it's not, it's live. You're in front of people, anything can go wrong and you really have to keep moving, move, moving forward. Um, but I thought it was just so great because it really did make me feel like if I, okay, I have this many things to do and on stage I have a million things to do and you have to focus and not look like a deer in the, head, in the headlights. And that's how I kind of brought it to acting. I mean, there's so many people around you and it, you're supposed to be acting like there's nobody in the room and you just have to black it out and just be very focused. And it's this weird thing that I don't know if any of you guys feel it like how I feel it, but I was incredibly nervous before every take and uh, I had a teacher tell me that if you're nervous it means that you care and I cared a lot. I cared so much um, about doing a good job and doing a good job for Paul in the movie um, but I would be so nervous and then when I would hear action it kind of felt like this weird wave of calm would come over me which is the same wave of calm that happens before I play music. I mean I'm before I'm incredibly nervous. I have stage fright and then it's like you step in through this like weird invisible curtain that you're just like, oh no, I got this. Maybe four minutes ago, I, I was pacing through my you know dressing room, being like, how? Why do I do this to myself? What am I doing? What am I what am I going through here? And then and it was nice to have that same wave uh, with acting and and with being in front of a camera. I mean, it it it's really weird and it feels like this inexplainable feeling, but it happened and it kind of feels like magic. <laughs> I, I want to ask everyone really about their relationship with directors, um, but you've mentioned Ridley Scott just now, and I'm curious, I mean, you know, in, in, in this incredibly dense, intricate kind of building of a character that you're talking about, did he just give you the space to do that? Or, I mean, is, or is there more of a direct collaboration going on between you and him? You know, I love working with Ridley so much. Um, the, from the very beginning, we had strong conversations about Patrizia, but it was interesting, like as the filming process began and as we started to work, he started really to come to me and say, okay, what is this scene about? He became interested in the way I saw her because I, he never spoke to me as, uh, 
as me, really. He he always called me Stefania. Um, I, Ridley doesn't know me as as Gaga. We, he doesn't refer to me that way. Um, and that was always important to me too, because little Stephanie, the, the the me inside of all of this acting is the place where I pull everything from when I'm working. Working with Ridley, I would say he ultimately empowered me to tell this story in the way that I believed uh, I wanted to, which, and I, I don't know how everybody else feels about this on the, on the call, working in your various scripts and your various stories and characters. But for me, it's like, how can many things be true at once? for a character uh, so that we, we're not telling these one dimensional stories that make women viewed by the world in this one dimensional way, but how are we multidimensional? And how can I both be a, a brutal character as well as somebody that's a mother? And, and uh, it, you know, there's a, there was a scene in the film that I, I, I was so grateful to uh, Ridley uh, for this, like, this series of moments that we shot. Uh, and it's after uh, Maurizio Gucci is murdered and I'm, um, I'm entering the house, there's paparazzi all outside. And I actually did a lot of sense memory work um, that dated back to the deepest trauma in my life, in the car. And as the car pulled up, I was doing this sense memory work. They yell action, I get out of the car. And I had made the decision not to take my daughter's hand as I was walking through the cameras to go into the house uh, that we used to live in together. Um, and I remember really allowing me to make these choices the choice that she would in this moment be so uh, paralyzed and the, her, that the, all her survival mechanisms would kick into gear that she would forget her daughter, that she would walk in uh, with, with, with no, uh, uh, no sense of, of, her, of her motherhood in that moment. And then yet when she would uh, arrive in the house, she would be faced with the woman that uh, had an affair with her husband and she would hold her and hug her and embrace her that they both loved the same man. So I, I, I'm telling this, this, this story to uh, give, provide some color to you of the ways in which the, my amazing uh, director, who's also a man, empowered me to make complicated female choices. And I, I don't think that that always happens. And I think sometimes uh, even in scripts, it can be uh, interesting to uh, the, the way that we have to swim against the current of a way a story is told. This script was written by a man and so much of the story is about a woman. So I, I spent a lot of time really advocating for women's stories. And uh, I think everybody here gave such beautiful performances. And I feel really, uh, really honored to be able to talk about this. And I'm interested what, what everyone thinks about, like what it's like to be a woman that's an actress, but also if, you, if, if, if the person that wrote the script is male or that the director is male, like how does that inform the performance and how does that change uh, the way that we tell our story? Well, that's a perfect segue to actually to bring Renata in. Uh, obviously, as we say, Julie is is this incredibly complex character. You know, she's a woman with with many parts, and you're working with Joachim Trier, um, a male director. So, how, yeah, how was that dynamic for you in that case? You know, playing this very complex woman in a film directed by a man. Yeah, and um, I knew that uh, the role was actually written for me, and it um, is written by two men, Eskil Vogt and Joachim Trier, and. Uh, I was really scared uh, reading the script the first time just to, I don't know, see that aspect of two men writing a female character and also um, how they kind of uh, thought that they saw me, you know? It's, um, but I think for you, Akim and Eskil, they are really humble and very curious and they really wanted my opinion and also like, uh, like you say, Lady Gaga, like th that they they wanted to invite me in with my perspective, and that was very important. And they knew that they needed that to make this story. And for them, it's not about writing a woman; it's about writing a human being, uh, starting with a character um, that is complex, and then a part of her identity is being a woman. And I really like that perspective going into this role. I feel a lot of her is. Um, is of course <laughs> her struggles as a woman, but also as uh, a person. And the themes are so universal. It, she, um, they talk about um, choices and they talk about loss and the, uh, of both people and the image that you have of yourself and what you thought you should be, thought you would be and what you always, don't become, <laughs> uh, no one plans to become, or 
some people do, but uh, um, like life is a chaos and it's like very big existential themes. And I felt really respected my, my uh, choices, my um, thoughts, they were very respected. So I felt very comfortable in working with them and uh, Joachim as a director too, very, very comfortable. And I, I was, there was some like small nuances that I needed to, I felt it was a little bit implied and romanticized that um, uh, the Axel, who is the, the male lead, he um, he's kind of defining Julie. So I try to make it into a problem that she actually don't know who she is so she, so she needs someone to define her and that's paradoxically why she has to leave him in the end because she doesn't want to be defined this is all subconsciously of course but, uh, and um also that uh maybe axel was the strongest one and this was maybe i don't think they meant to write it but uh, that maybe they just think that that if you are well articulated if you know exactly what happens at every time if you can structure see the structure of your life and uh, and put it into words you are the strong part of the relationship and I really fought for chaos and um, to not know exactly where you are or who to be and I'm not saying that's a feminine quality really but it might sometimes be um, um, yeah that it might sometimes just uh, be put on women, that that's how we are, even though we can be different things. But I feel I touched on some themes and started talking about some themes with this movie. And of course, it's a long way to go still, but I think a part of it. How does this beautiful coming of age film? Uh, and you've been acting and performing since you were a kid. And I wondered watching it, whether there was a point maybe with Coda itself, where you thought, okay, that was me as a child, essentially having fun, and now this is my career. Or in fact, you know, was it, has it all been your career? Or actually, are you still just having fun? I mean, I'm always having fun. I, I, I love this. It was so much fun, but it was bloody hard work. And I, as much as it was fun, there were moments where I would wobble and think, what have I signed up to do? You know, I had never had a singing lesson before Coda. I didn't know any American Sign Language. I had never been fishing, let alone on a trawler. I didn't know how to interpret. I didn't even realize that that was a skill I'd have to learn. I, uh, I'd never done a Massachusetts accent. And so there was just a big fat no by every single skill that was required. And so it did make me, you said nerves, it made me nervous, but I think that's what's so amazing about this job. You know, when you are scared, it pushes you and it gets you out of your comfort zone and you learn so much. And I think because I am really young, I'm all for learning. I learn from amazing people I work with. I'm learning from all of you right now, hearing all of your experiences. I learned so much from Sean. If I talk about Sean, she is a phenomenal director. She took a chance when she cast me and I was 17 and British and, and, um, it was a big role, but I love that Sean takes risks. She's a trailblazer and, and she also learned American Sign Language with me. And so when I had the scenes like both sides now at the end of the movie, going into that scene because she had learned sign language, she knew how hard that scene was and she was kind of such a supporter. Um, like for instance, that scene, like going into both sides now, um, I had to make sure my acting was, I guess, tonally where it needed to be. I had to sing in an accent that wasn't my own and sing in tune because all the singing was recorded live on set and Ruby gets into Berkeley, which is like one of the best music schools ever. Um, and I had to I had to make sure that, that my sign language was accurate because no matter how many takes you do, if your sign language is only accurate in one, that's the only take they can pick in the edit. And because we were an independent film with no money and no time, you don't get that many takes anyway. And um, you know, we all, I think, can agree that more takes to choose from in the edit is better. <laughs> and so going into that scene, it very much was kind of multitasking under pressure. So it was a challenge, but it was fun because when I finished that scene, I can't explain, I can't actually explain the feeling when we wrapped as well. When I finished it, it's like, it was so rewarding and, and I felt really proud that I'd kind of completed it. But I had a great group of people that helped me with this role. So it did make it still fun. And my mom came with me too to help me and support me and make sure I didn't have to worry about anything else but my sign language. Because often it would change the day before and 
So I had, I had a lot on my plate, but I had great people surrounding me to help me out. I wanted to ask you, Amelia, but I'm actually, again, I'm going to ask everyone this, this same question before we go to audience questions. Um, you know, how much you've kind of, we've, we've touched on this a little bit, actually, but how much you sort out other actors' performances, and you know, in particular movies, and how much you seek out other movies to, to learn from and to kind of measure yourself against? I, I mean, I, I want to seek out other, other people's movies because they give you you know, something in your heart and that that's the inspiration. I don't, I don't think it's about looking for, particularly for technique because there are many ways, as everybody has said, there are, you're an individual, you have your processes and you have the context in which you're working and all sorts of things that will make it very difficult to just mimic or even work with those, that sort of uh, energy in the same way. But but I do think other people's movies, I mean, films for me changed my life. When I was a young person and I didn't know that you could think differently or act differently in this world, it was films that showed me. And that, and that still is the case today. I, I seek, the, I mean, the, the films we're talking about here are films that mean a lot to me personally, each one of them actually, for different reasons. But that's really truly part of who I am. And that that imaginative, emotional, moral change of point of view is what I go to the cinema for. And so without that, I, I wouldn't be so, you know, I'm so proud to be part of that that stream.